may I have your attention? Please welcome TechCrunch reporter Hayayan Camps, Chris Hurd, founder and CEO of First Base, Janine O'Neill, talent director Sequoia, and Emil Jurgen, vice president of talent at Gusto. Ah. Wait till the music stops. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful Q and A session about uh, how to secure the first hard to find hires. Um, I'm joined with a illustrious panel. I'm super excited to ask questions too, and you also get to ask questions. Uh, somewhere around there should be a QR code or some such that makes whatever you type into your little phone device turn up on my uh, screen, and then I can ask questions for you. Please do that liberally um, because uh, it's more fun that way. Would you guys quickly like to introduce yourselves and uh, in one sentence summarize what you do and what your company does? I start. Uh, I'm Chris Hurd. I'm the founder of firstbase.com. Um, and we help companies provide the tools and equipment workers need to work from home. Awesome. Thank you. I'm Janine O'Neill. And I work at Sequoia Capital. We're a venture capital firm that invests in seed to growth and beyond. And my role, I lead go-to-market recruiting, um, executive, and all levels for our portfolio companies. Um, my name is Emil Jurgen. Um, I'm a VP of talent at uh, Gusto, um, and we're the people platform. We uh, partner with small to medium-sized businesses to uh, eradicate some of those, uh, those pain points on the back end that come with things like payroll, benefits, hiring, onboarding, so on and so forth. Awesome. So. Um, I've done a bunch of startups myself, and the number one thing that almost always screws me over is hiring the first few people, right? I look around at my friends and go like, okay, which, which of you can I rope into this for the first few months? And after that, I'm like, where do you go? As a startup that doesn't, you know, you don't have infinite money, you don't really have a name to, for people to recognize yet, like, where do you begin? Yeah, I, I've heard a variant of this a lot recently, which is like when you hire your friends, like think about a Venn diagram and your skills almost always like overlap a lot. Um, when you're thinking about a startup, think about it as like a large area. And what's best is like hire people where you cover the most surface area. Um, I think like the second part is people tend to overhire on CVs and they don't, hit, uh, they don't hire for people like, that fit the business. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when you're building a business, you need people that are gonna perform and achieve the outcomes that you need to hit. Um, and that isn't necessarily the best person on a CV. Yeah. What do you guys do to, uh, to help founders actually find their first humans? Like, what is your top advice? So, we definitely tell founders that even though you're maybe a product person, you need to spend about 70% of your time recruiting. So it is a departure from maybe your favorite thing to do, but it's the only way to build the company. So when you start out thinking, all right, now I have to shift my time, then you're really opening up, what is the process? How do I attack? How do I do this? What's the first role? And generally from seed companies, you're hiring engineers and you're starting to think about the sales motion. Um, as a founder, you're probably the first salesperson at the company, and you need to think about, uh, well, how do I scale this? How do I scale my, uh, my efforts? And then you start to hire somebody who has those skills, probably a product marketing person to help you start to frame out what your ideal customer profile is, and really, when you talk through what has to be done step by step, it's really um, just spending the time, the hours, the energy, the effort, making it very much a personal, uh, a personal effort, um, customizing outreach. Um, you're really talking about hiring outside of your immediate sphere. And so you have to be uh, willing to start putting your story um, in place, so not just who you are as a founder, but why you're the person who is tackling this problem, so that founder product fit and communicating that to the outside world. That's the beginning of your brand. Yeah, I yeah. love that. And, and what I'd say is, you know, it's about finding that talent market fit. Uh, I think as founders, you talk a lot about product market fit. You're soliciting input, you're soliciting feedback. 
it's no different when you're trying to hire folks, right? Networking is everything, soliciting input is everything. And when you get that feedback, when you get that input, you're then ready to put together a story, a narrative that goes beyond just what your company vision is, but it's why someone should entrust their career in the next four to five years of their lives with you, right? So again, I think it's, it's about taking a lot of different inputs and making it so that you're putting your best foot forward, not only when you're talking about your company, but when you're branding yourself as someone that someone should wanna work with. Yeah. And so where do you even start to find people? Like, uh, like what does your top of funnel look like as an, as an early stage founder? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're thinking about early, it, it's a lot about network, right? Um, and it's not necessarily just hiring your friends or the people that, you know, or your dorm mates in, in school, right? It's about just networking and putting yourself out there. Um, and the more conversations that you can have, the more people that those people can introduce you to. Um, so I think first and foremost is willing, a willingness to put yourself out there to meet new people um, and solicit input as to the opportunities that you have. I think from there, um, you know, it's really important um, is spending time on it, right? Again, in some cases, hiring can take three, six, nine, 12 months to find those right folks. And you gotta be committed to doing all that it takes to get to that place. Uh, you can't spend three weeks on it and give up, right? Um, so really being able to prioritize what's most important, right? And people are gonna be huge inputs as to whether or not your company is gonna be successful or not. Um, so ensuring that you have that same level of veracity as you think about finding those people as you do in finding that product market fit. And I feel like in a world where um, working from home is much easier, like working remotely is much easier, I feel like if you're uh, tapping into your network, it's almost always geographically based, right? But now we have the entire world at our fingertips. And we specifically got a question in here, um, you know, like how would you feel about uh, hiring remote uh, developers and maybe specifically from, from Latin America? Um, for price and time zone reasons? We see a lot of our portfolio companies looking for solutions to more volume engineer hiring. There, are, um, Three years ago, there were very few of these companies and it's just blossomed. There's a lot of companies now as a platform that you can hire a handful of engineers. They might be in geographic time zones that are not advantageous. Certainly, Latin America would be more aligned with California. Uh, so there are so many more options. And when you talk about where do I find talent, now the world is your oyster. So it's really possible to look in a lot of places. It's still going to take a lot of time. You still have to put in the time and effort. And I think one way it just comes to mind because founders, when you get together and talk to other founders about the challenges, you'll find that other people can be a great resource see what they've tried, see what they've done. I think founders having community helps them really get to some answers and have someone else that they can bounce things off of. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I'm, I'm also curious, like, there's a question here from the audience, which um, I'd like your opinion of, if you're available for that, which is, like, is there a space for apprenticeships and, like, junior staff in an early team? Yes. <laughs> cool. Next question. <laughs> what? Is, like, how do yeah, you? I mean, it's it, it's hard, right? Like, I, I think when people talk about um, the ability to learn via osmosis, and they're typically talking about soft professional skills, um, some of that is required to be in person. Now, I think there's an aspect or or admission to be made around well, collaboration and communication isn't is better in person, and there are certain things that we want to build those skills for, um, and I think that specifically pertains to younger people who have just graduated. So yeah, I think there's onboarding to be built around how do you do that in person? How do you connect them with mentors in the company where they can get those skills? Um, and really when we do come together, if we are a remote company, when we do come together physically, using those opportunities to build those communication and collaboration skills that don't really help any, uh, come any other way. Yeah, um, pretty good answer, thank you. Um, we have a question specifically for Sequoia, which is, uh, what commonalities have you seen in how the best founders in your, in your network uh, do their hiring? Do they do something different? Uh, what makes them really good as persuaders for in inviting people to join the company? Um, well, as, um, as I said about founders being the first salespeople, they are spending, the best founders are spending a huge amount of time recruiting and spending their own personal 
uh, energy and effort to create customized messaging. One uh, founder, Joe Thomas, a founder of Loom, sent individual looms to engineers, individual contributor engineers that spoke specifically to that person, talked about what he liked about their background, and it was impossible for someone to refuse a direct appeal, and he had great results. I think for whatever level you're recruiting for, it's important to, as a founder, uh, be very uh, uncanned. Just be very specific about that person. I mean, everybody's living in a world where they're receiving a lot of incoming requests. And when you see something that's personal and it's from a founder, it really does stand out. And I think the best founders take that seriously and build the company like brick by brick, like everything matters. Yeah. Uh, Emil, I kind of want to ask you a question as well, which is um, like beyond the resume itself, which mm -hmm. we're starting to figure out, right? And we mentioned that maybe that's not the best way to uh, only screen your uh, applicants. Like, what do you actually look for in in your early hires in your early team? Yeah, and I think it's been touched upon a little bit already. It, it, it's you know, do you bring that holistic skill set? I think it's very easy to get into this mode of um, looking at only. Uh, uh, you know, skill-based hiring when the reality of it is, I think as an early hire or as an early employee at a company, you gotta do a lot of stuff, right? And what is in a job description may be only a fraction of the work that you'll have to do in order to see uh, your startup succeed. Uh, so I think about finding those, those, those opportunities and, and looking beyond just the companies that you've worked at, the school you went to, but really looking to find those opportunities to solicit whether or not someone as gritty, right? Is someone gonna you know, take on the company's problems as my own? Um, does someone wanna see uh, a company scale over the course of time and do they wanna scale their careers alongside of it? Um, so I really think just going beyond just, you know, can you code yes or no? And a lot of the binary stuff that we typically base our hiring practices around are gonna be very, very quickly outdated, especially um, if you're a startup. I think you know, that's a luxury that maybe larger companies can have, right? Because it's more task-based. But I think as a company builder, you have to bring a holistic skill set to the table. Um, and whether or not you can put together zeros and ones isn't the only thing that's going to make that difference. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, time zones. Because, I mean, again, global hiring market, that kind of thing. One of my previous companies, I had a team in Thailand, a team in, Lon team in London, and I was here. It was a perfect eight-hour difference, which makes it almost impossible to do any real-time work. And tools like Loom and tools like other um, uh, async tools are really, really powerful for that. Is there a way that you can optimize your hiring process uh, to, to think about time zones and, and like synchronous collaboration, or is that less important now? Somebody wants to grab that. <laughs> Um, I, I think it's less important. Mm -hmm. I think some overlap is still necessary. Um, we tend to go for eight hours. So if we're in the UK, we've got people on the East Coast and people on the West Coast. The people on the West Coast typically work East Coast hours. Mm. Um, and that's just something you need to commit to. Um, we want to be more asynchronous, but I think there's a danger that you become too asynchronous and then you think everyone else wants to be asynchronous and then you're not synchronous enough. Right. So if you don't have the overlap, that obviously becomes a huge problem. Yeah. And obviously that needs to be part of the hiring process and, and the for expectation sure. settings like, hey, we actually expect you to work New York hours. Yep. <laughs> if that works for you, then that's great. But yeah. yeah. And, and I'd add, I think it's a spectrum, right? I think, um, you know, one of the things that is really, really important, especially in today's market, uh, is meeting talent where they are. Right. And I think in your early stages, that, that can mean a host of things. Right. It can mean meeting them. Um, on a 10 to six work schedule as opposed to a nine to five, it could mean meeting them in Indonesia as opposed to San Francisco. Um, if that's the talent that's gonna help scale your company, then I think that's where you kind of have to base your philosophy around. I think as you scale, um, to Chris's point, you can start to think a little bit more about um, uh, cohorts of folks, right? Because I think uh, that community, that connection, the ability to come together um, in your locales becomes important as well. Um, so I don't think there's a one size fits all, there's no silver bullet to it. I think you just have to base your hiring strategy around what's going to work for your company in the immediate, um, and then giving yourself an opportunity to scale out over the course of time. Yeah. Um, another good question from the audience here, which is like looking at it from the other side as a potential applicant, how can you showcase your fit with a startup? Is there something like, the, like a potential hire could do? Uh, I, I can speak what we look for. Please. Um, we want builders. Right, like when you're coming to a startup, it's because you want to have an outsized impact on what you're working on. Um, 
the last, we, we were upstairs on a different stage and the question was like, well, what happens if you're in the final two of the candidate and it's startup fan company? Right. Total anti-pattern, <laughs> right? Mm. Like, should we be hiring those people or, or not? And yeah, I, I think what you want is people that understand how hard it is because startups are hard. They, they understand how much work it is but they can take things and run with it and ultimately deliver on what needs to be achieved rather than optimizing where a button's placed. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think for a um, question specifically for Gusto here, I suppose, uh, two questions really, uh, like do you hire engineers abroad and do you hire internationally? And I guess the second part of that same question, like are Gusto's tools uh, evolving to be more internationally focused as well? Yeah, so in terms of hiring internationally for engineers, um, it's something that we're starting to, to delve into. It's not something that we've uh, like programmatized um, quite yet, but the answer and the reason is because of your second question, right? I think the level of intentionality that goes around scaling a team internationally needs to be very, very high, right? I don't think you go out and hire people and then figure it out later. I think you ensure that you have tools, you have systems, you have processes, um, and you have a flying formation that's gonna allow these folks to be set up for success. You know, I think the stakes of hiring is higher than it's ever been. It's more difficult to hire good talent than it's ever been. So what sense does it make to spend all this time, all this energy, all these very personalized, crafted messages to go hire someone, and then they leave three to six months later? That's a waste of time, right? So to me, it's about really finding that intentionality around your strategy. If we want to go international, do we have the supplementary systems that are going to allow these folks to be set up for success? Are we going to be able to evaluate them properly? How do we take into consideration some of the different cultural components that come into an interview process so we can be equitable? Um, and I think once you have those boxes checked, then I think you can take the next step and, and start to hire internationally more voluminously. But I think in our case, we want to be thoughtful, we want to be intentional, and we want to be equitable in our approaches. So we have to move slow to move fast. Yeah, great answer, thank you. Um, I'm curious, like, um, there, you were talking about hiring the right people for the right job, and I was wondering if you could say something about, and that is balanced with as a startup needing to run as fast as you possibly can because you know you have a, a runway and a, a place to get to. Yep. Um, do you have a sense of like, do you wait for the right person, or do you hire the person who's like ninety percent there and hope it works works out? I know it's a very biased question. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, can, I can take it, but we definitely love to hear these two's answers. Um, I think it's a balance, right, um, and. If you were to tell me what that 90% is, I'd give you a better answer. Mm. If you told me they're a 90% skill set, but 100% motivation and values alignment and wants to grind with us, I'd say absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is the right person. If you told me it's someone who has 100% of the skill set and only 50% of the grit, 50% of the company building uh, skill set that we're looking for, I'd say that's absolutely not the right fit. Mm -hmm. right? So I think it's about finding what that right balance for your specific company is. I think for us, and one of the things that we do that's pretty unique is we do a values and motivation alignment interview, which is a departure from like your technical, can you code, can you uh, do architecture type of interview. But we want to talk to folks and give them an opportunity to talk to someone who's not on their local team, but to be able to talk about what it's like to be an employee at Gusto, talk about some of the softer things about company building, and really dig deep into what their why is, right? And in those interviews, we have an opportunity to learn a little bit more about that candidate, but we also have an opportunity to create a resonant message. So if we do go to offer, the hope is that we've created enough connection, enough resonant messaging, that we've created a value proposition that's hard to say no to. So I think it's a lot of the small things that really come into it, but to answer your question succinctly, it really all depends. It all depends. <laughs> but I'll, just to clarify a little bit, I mean, what a company needs um, as far as a marketing leader at Series A is not the same thing as what a company needs at Series C or D. And so companies evolve and certain people self-select in what they like to do. So there's building involved in all these phases, but there's different flavors of building. And so it's pretty important to know if uh, the person is the right person for that time period and if they can do the work that's necessary to get to the next phase. Some people can scale and plenty of stories exist of people scaling to you know, much bigger companies. So it's unusual though, it's, it's not the norm. So the right person for that right time is the right hire. Now, what are the ingredients of that 19% is pretty important. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I, can I add one thing before we go to the next question? Yeah. Um, most companies are terrible at hiring. Yes. And like, if you know the 90%, like you know someone's a 90% fit, 
probably means you're better at hiring. Mm -hmm. And I think like the reason why people are terrible at hiring is because companies lie to themselves. They, they hire on vibes, right? You said at the, the front, like, well, I'm going to hire a bunch of my friends. You're never going to hire the right people. Whereas like, if, if I say, like, to Janine's point, right now for the business, this is what we need to achieve in marketing. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And we tick nine of the boxes, so they're a 90% fit. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like we know they're going to crush those things. We know exactly how we can augment them on the gap that they do have. Most companies never get to a point where they understand like this is what needs to be done. This is who's going to do it and bring those two pieces together. Yeah. Um, and so in the earliest stages, um, we often see people like um, you start with a, a CEO and a CTO and you kind of build from there. How do you think about hiring C-level people into an organization? Uh, and I specifically would like your answer for this, uh, Janine, because I feel like as an investor, I imagine you see a lot of movement in, in the top, top positions. So uh, <clears throat> for clarity, are you talking about C-level or are you talking about exec level? Uh, the question was C-level, uh, but maybe both, both questions. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, look, every company is unique. And so I will say there's not like one answer, copy paste it, and it fits your company. However, there are certain things that have to be in place for the, the role to be big enough, the scope to be big enough, the need to be big enough for the role to be a C-level role. So at the beginning, you don't need a C-level anything. It's fine if you're a founder and you want to call yourself a CEO, of course. And the people that you hire in different functions are going to be maybe head of some function and then they'll evolve as the company gets bigger and there's more complexity and there's growth that you're hiring at the VP level and then at some point you, you will need to hire a C-level person again. Mapping to size of the company as measured by things like revenue or number of people or complexity of the company, certain sectors demand a C level sooner because they're incredibly complex. Um, that would be how I would answer that. Yeah, no, that's great. I can I can add to that too. I think. Please. <clears throat> and Chris, you've inspired me, by the way. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you have to be really mindful of if you're looking to hire an executive or a C level um, individual is you got to be honest about what the problems and the pain points that you're hiring this person to come solve, right? I, I've seen so many examples of of job descriptions or um, interview processes and the way that a job is sold, highlighting all the great things, right? This is great, everything is rosy, everything is great, right? I think if you're trying to find that right person, you have to be honest about the problems that you're running into, um, the scalability challenges that you might be experiencing, and why this person can come in and help solve those things. I think a lot of folks think about you know, hiding the, the, the potentially downsides of a role or some of the challenges that you run into, I find it to be a lot more alluring to folks, the right folks, that is, that if they can understand what those challenges are, they can see how their experience is going to directly apply mm. and help scale the company and be a great partner and help get you to that next level. So that's my advice to everyone. It's like, be super honest about what you're experiencing, what you're hopeful that this person can bring to the table. And more times than not, if you find that right person, they're going to be energized and invigorated by the problem set, not, not afraid of it. Mm. And you're saying to do that as part of the earlier part of the interview process even? A thousand percent, right? Yeah. On your, in your first recruiter call, on your first founder call, every step of the way, talk about the good, but also talk about the challenges, right? And get their perspective on these things. Because I think you can turn these interviews into, you know, pseudo working sessions, right? Like, let's talk about a strategy. Let's talk about how you would take these problems and structurally come up with a 30, 60, 90, 365, 7, whatever the math around that is, um, of type of solution. Right? And you get a better understanding of what it's like to work with that person and how they would operate under those conditions versus these very hypothetical, like, if the world were perfect, what would you do? Right. That doesn't give you much intel. Turns out it's not. <laughs> so, I mean, one example um, would be um, we have a portfolio company that was looking to hire a head of finance. And they were unsure and had seen a lot of candidates. And this particular finance executive had worked for another Sequoia company in the past. And the best thing that, that we did was put the two founders together. And what comforted the founder around this individual is the stories that 
this person was in it with, the, with this other founder in the trenches, regularly up until four in the morning, working really hard. And this really um, was what, it is how this uh, finance leader is wired. At that stage, is a builder is willing to, you know, stay all night working on some problem. And so it's not like the people that want to go to the fang company are going to be a fit for that scenario, right? They're not going to have a back channel that says, or a reference that says, yeah, they're up till four in the morning working on this one problem with me. Yeah. Um, so I think the referencing and getting that kind of testimonial I think goes a long way. I love it. We're out of time. Chris, Janine, Emil, thank you so much for your help. Thank you for asking way more questions than I could get to. And uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Cheers. Thanks.